This is Charles Hedry coming from Camel's Hill Baptist Church. We are in our Bible study in the book of Philippians. Today we are in chapter 4, verses 10 through 20. This session today is our final study in the book of Philippians. Uh, we have, including today, spoken on 11 different things that Paul addressed to the church at Philippi. And today is our very last one. I want to express my joy and appreciation for those who have been in this study with us and for the opportunity that I've had to do this Bible study. Hopefully down the way uh, in a few uh, weeks or so, uh, maybe back with another study, but uh, today will be my final day for a few weeks. As an adult, or perhaps listening to me this morning, or would be some students hearing me, there is a question that I want to ask you to think seriously about, and here it is. Have you learned how to handle life? Or to put it another way, up to this point in your life, do you consider yourself somewhat a success or a total failure? That leads us to the next question. What makes a successful life? Someone said, either we learn how to handle life or life will handle us. Today I want to speak on the topic, learning to handle life. In 1923, some of America's most financially successful businessmen at that time met at the Edgewater Beach Hotel in Chicago. In that meeting was Charles Schwab, president of the largest steel company in America, Samuel Insull, president of Amer the America's largest utility company, Howard Hobson, president of America's largest gas company, Richard Whitney, president of the New York Stock Exchange, Albert Fall, a member of the president's cabinet, Jesse Livermore, multimillionaire, Ivan Kruger, head of the world's largest monopoly, and Leon Frazier, president of the International Bank of Settlements. This was in 1923. By 1948, just 25 years later, Charles Schwab died bankrupt. Insull died without a penny to his name and a fugitive from the law. Hobson died penniless. William Whitney, president of the New York Stock Exchange, had just been released from Sing Sing Prison. Fall died at home after receiving a prison pardon. Livermore died of a suicide. Kruger committed suicide. Leon Frazier committed suicide. All of these very wealthy men in American financial history never learned how to handle their life. Life handled them, and they died alone and broke. What a sad, sad story. Paul learned the secret of handling life. He experienced far more than most of us will ever experience in our lives. He had been shipwrecked. He faced starvation. He lay sick in a cold, damp prison cell. He experienced life's good times and life's bad times. These were times, when Paul writes this letter, that he could have used some help from some Christian friends and churches that he had previously started. He writes this letter to the Philippian church because they were going through a tough time in their life. And Paul wanted to give them the secret of how uh, Paul uh, wanted this church to handle their situation in Jesus Christ. In the past, in the last part of his letter to this church at Philippi, which could easily be most any church today, Paul wants to encourage them. So we'll look at these last few verses 
on how to handle light for encouragement. First of all, Paul says, learn to lean upon others who seek to minister to your need. Now this is a tough one. This is one that affects me a whole lot. Learning to lean upon others who seek to minister to you. And he says this message to this church of Philippi. The church of Philippi had learned that Paul was in Rome, in jail, waiting for Nehru to hand down a death sentence. Usually, it was execution by cutting off the head. The church wanted to help Paul with some of his need. So they sent one of their lay members of the church to Rome to help Paul. They had already written to, Paul had already written to this church concerning some problems they were facing. But now he shifts gears, starting here in verse 10 of chapter 4. Paul thanks the church at Philippi for their help, their generosity in his time of need. I want us to take the scripture now and see what Paul said to this church about how to handle their life. Verse 10 says, I rejoice greatly in, at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but I have no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me the strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, no one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Not that I was looking for a gift, but I am looking for what may be credited to your account. I have received full payment and even more. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Ephroditus the gifts you sent. They are fragrant offerings, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Learn to lean upon those who want to minister to your need. Paul thanks this church for the help he had received from them. Sometimes when people want to reach out and help us when we might be in need, uh, we kind of throw up a wall of resistance. Well, we sometimes think, well, I can handle this myself, or, you know, I don't want to bother them, and I don't want to put them out, and on and on and on, we get these reasons why we resist those who want to minister to our needs. There are those times, though, when we must allow people, in Christ especially, to express their love, their support, and their generosity to us when we have a need. And that is not easy to do for many people. So, we want to go on here and see what Paul says. In verses 14 and 15, to the believers in this church, he says, what you have done for me was a good thing, a wonderful ministry that you tried to share in my needs and when Paul was having great needs. In fact, as Paul said to this church, they were the only church who ever attempted to help Paul <coughs> at that particular time. But he goes on to say in verse 17, he wanted the church to know 
and he was not looking for help from them at this time. You may think Paul sounds a little selfish by saying he was not expecting any help from them. But what Paul wanted this church to know was that he was not begging for their help. He didn't have a particular need that he was demanding or hoping or praying or wishing that church would fulfill. It's a wonderful thing when Christians or churches recognize there are people who have great needs and we need to try to reach out and minister to and fulfill those needs the best we know how to do. But before Paul goes on in verse 18, this was not the first time this church had ever responded to Paul and his need. And he wants them to know how thankful and grateful he felt for them for meeting those needs at that time. We see another lesson Paul is trying to teach. There are times you and I as Christians or people we know that need help and need assistance. And we as Christians are to reach out and to touch their lives and to touch that need the best we know how. We need to support one another in love, the love of Christ. So at those times, don't let our selfish pride get in the way that God is leading others to try to minister to a special need that you might have. We do that. We, we do it unconsciously. I do it. It's a tough thing for me to admit that there are people who can do some things for me that I can't do for myself. And so Paul is reminding them that remember this, be thankful and be grateful and receive from others what they are trying to do to you in ministry to the needs that you have that you may not be able to meet or handle yourself alone. Even the unbelievers in Paul's day said about these Christians, about the church at Philippi, see how they love one another. They're called Christians by the way they love one another. How much some of our churches need to hear from the world say this about them because we are to love people like Christ loved them. We are to reach out to people like Christ reached out. We ought to minister to the needs of people like Christ ministered to people's needs. We are to sacrificially give what we can give and do what we can do like Christ did for those he found in need. This is God's love in action. When we love one another this much, be they a church member or not, be they a Christian or not, <coughs> this much, if we love them so much, that we're willing to reach out and meet these needs the best we can. The world will see that, and the world will recognize that kind of love and support and dedication and commitment those Christians in that church has for the needs of others. We may not recognize it, but we benefit when we reach out and minister to others. I remember trying to teach many uh, lay people in my churches where I pastored that when you go out and knock on doors and try to witness a, to a person and you see a man or a woman or a child come to give their heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ, when you leave that home, you're the one that is rejoicing. I go away feeling probably greater than the one who got saved. Uh, that may not be completely accurate. Uh, there's rejoicing in heaven when that one gets saved. But, what I'm saying is, meeting their need meets a need of mine to bring joy and peace and happiness that I have done something God has led me to do and God has blessed me as a result. Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin. Because of that, we have clothes on our body. Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone. Look how communication is possible in the world today. Louis Pasteur perfected the way we can 
immunize ourselves from diseases. Look at the lives that have been saved. The Curies discovered radium, which makes radiation that treats cancer and other health problems. Gutenberg invented the printing press to make printing possible. Look at all the printed material in the world. Thomas Edison invented the electric bulb so we could read and see at night under electrical power. It takes no rocket scientist for most of us to realize today how we need each other and especially in the church. How others can do things that will provide for the needs of those who may not be able to help themselves. This was especially true for the Christians and the church in the world in Paul's day and in our day today. There is much we can do to meet and minister to one another. All of this is what Paul would describe as learning how to live our lives effectively for Jesus Christ by meeting the needs of others that we have the capability of helping. But Paul moves on to a second thing <coughs> he learned about how to handle life. The second thing is, Learn to accept the things you cannot change. I've recently gone through some of that. Some things have happened to me health-wise uh, that has affected my life in many ways. Now, there are some of those things I can help myself with. But there are other things that happen sometimes I can't do anything about it. There, it is not in my power nor strength to do it. So we have to learn there are some things we cannot change in life, but we must depend upon God. He describes this in verses 11 and 12. He says, I have learned how to be content in every situation I'm in. In other words, I've learned how to be satisfied in my personal life. Whatever happens to me, I know God is going to be with me, and he's going to deliver me. Paul says there will be circumstances or things that will happen to us in our lives we cannot do anything about. Even as Christians, we think, I can handle this. I can take care of this problem. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Learn to accept the things you can't change. You will not experience long life until you discover there are some things that you can't do and you can't change only God can do and only God can change. And you will be happier and live longer when God is in control of your life and not you. Paul says to the church, I've learned to be content in, with the things that I cannot change. As mentioned, Paul faced a lot that you and I will never face. But he learned in his relationship with Christ, he can still be happy. He can still be satisfied. He can still be contented. How could he say that? Truthfully, how could he say that? Paul believed whatever happened to him, if it was God's will, he didn't have to worry about it. He didn't have to change it. He didn't have to try to change the circumstances. He didn't have to try to change the people. He didn't have to try to do anything but trust God. We all have a hard time doing that, myself included. Paul left everything in the hands of God. Therefore, he had peace in his heart. Many people don't have peace in their heart because we're trying to control our life instead of letting God control things we can't control. Paul had joy even in hard, difficult times. Sometimes when we lose our joy, we completely fall apart. Our health is completely destroyed. Our effectiveness and usefulness for Christ may be completely gone because it is pride, it is selfishness that keeps us from being able to handle life through Jesus Christ. So he left it all in God's hand. He let God be in charge of his life. He let God bring contentment into his spirit because God has something 
far greater plan for your life than what this present moment may be showing you. We don't understand why some things happen the way they do and how, how come it takes place. But when you learn to be content in Christ, you know this, that Christ is in charge. He's in control. He's got everything moving the way he wants it to go. There's a reason. There's a person. There's a purpose. So be content. Be satisfied in Christ. Let Christ do what Christ only can do. And what Paul is saying here is the way Christ may choose to do that is through the ministry of other people around us who have the knowledge, who have the resources, who have the experience to be able to help us and minister to us in ways we cannot do for ourselves. So be content to do God's will. Paul concludes his thoughts about the church at Philippi when he expresses his true thankfulness and his, and his heart of great gratitude for the way they administer to his needs. He teaches these believers that his life in Christ was not dependent on their gifts, but on the heart that he had that was a grateful heart. You may think Paul sounds selfish, but he wasn't. He needed help from time to time. He got that help. He was grateful. Therefore, Paul could say, I can rejoice in the Lord even if no one comes to help me. No question Paul was living under tremendous stress. He was in prison waiting execution. He had no control over the situation. He did not get upset or angry. He did not complain. Paul learned after years of suffering, after being beaten many times, left for dead in the street, suffering in the damp, cold jail cells, oftentimes going hungry, he had learned to be content. Contentment is, suff is suffering for oneself. He wasn't bragging about having to go through all of that to endure all that, but he was giving a testimony that in every situation he faced, he could find peace and joy, contentment and happiness in Jesus Christ. It was not dependent on himself, and God may choose to use others to minister to our needs. There are events and circumstances you and I are going to face in life that we cannot change. Our faith in Christ will not change the circumstances. Our prayers may not eliminate every circumstance. Time will not cause circumstances just to fade away. But as a believer in Christ, Paul learned to bear up under those burdens that he was first and foremost loved by Christ, that Christ even suffered death so he could live. Why should he feel the need to be rescued? He was content. He was satisfied. He knew that though there were things he couldn't do anything about, there might be others that God would send to him that could help him, that could minister to him, like this church at Philippi. And then finally, learn to draw your strength you need from Jesus, not from this world. There's a story of a man who had just died and was reviewing his footsteps that he had taken in his life. He observed that over uh, the mountains and difficult places of life where he had walked, there was only one set of footprints. Turning to Jesus, the, uh, the man said, why is, there over, why is over the easy places in my life you walk beside me and there were only two sets of footprints, yours and mine? But in the hard places of life, I can only see one set of footprints. Where were you when I really needed you walking with me? Jesus said to the man, It's true. When your life was easy, I was walking beside you. But when the way was hard and difficult, I picked you up and I carried you. And that's why you see only one set of footprints. That was Paul's message and Paul's experience. 
another true story. And I'm closing out. Horatio G. Spafford wrote of a dark experience in his life when he thought he could not go on and live. He had just lost most of his real estate holdings in a fire in Chicago in 1871. In 1873, he planned a trip to Europe with his family. But at the last minute, he could not go with them. So he sent them on, and he planned to join them later on. He kissed his wife and four daughters, put them on the ship, and watched them sail out of sight. The ship was later struck by a storm, and in 12 minutes sank to the bottom of the ocean. His wife and four daughters did not survive. When he heard this tragic news, he boarded another ship for England. At one point in the Atlantic, the ship's captain took Stanford on deck to show him the very spot where the ship sunk that took the life of his wife and four daughters. He returned to his cabin and wrote down these words, When peace attendeth my way. When sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. When Spafford returned home, his other son who had remained with him and caught him by, uh, 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 when, he, when he got home, his son caught scarlet fever and died. This son was only 14 years old. His church family reached out and just could not figure out what happened to him and why he was having such a hard time. They said, you must have sinned. You need to repent. When he said, no, I do not need to sin. I did not sin. There was nothing I could do to prevent their deaths. So the church asked him to leave the church. That's really reaching out to someone in need. Paul had gone through unbelievable times, but he learned how to handle life instead of letting life handle him. Robert Louis Stevens tells the story of his grandfather caught in a terrible storm at sea one night. He was in danger of losing his life, and he walked up to the deck to see how bad things looked, but in a moment he discovered great comfort. He saw the captain doing his best to keep the ship away from the rocks, steering the ship into safer waters. Going back to his cabin, he thought to himself, we are going to make it through safely. Well, I close out our study with one of my favorite hymns that I, I love so much. I want you to hear the words. It goes like this. I am satisfied with Jesus. He has done so much for me. He has suffered to redeem me. He has died to set me free. He was with me in all my trials. Best of friends, he is. I can always count on Jesus. But can he always count on me? I can hear the voice of Jesus calling out so pleadingly, Go and win the lost and the stray. Is he satisfied with me when my work on earth is ended and I cross the mystic sea? Oh, that I could hear him saying, I am satisfied with thee. I am satisfied with thee. But the question comes to me as I think of Calvary. Is my master satisfied with me? Is Jesus satisfied with your life? Paul says, turn to him, lean on him, let him minister to us, let others help us that have the ability to do so. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this study we've had. Take these words. Help us to apply them to our lives and our churches. In Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen.